be with my family here in Cornerstone, and um, I apologize, but my notes came in late, so they're not in your your conference brochure. They are printed outside the in a separate piece of paper, and if you need one of those, if you, um, perhaps you could raise your hand, and someone could um, from the back could help you if you need some of those notes. So we're going to cover a snapshot of Solomon and the Shulamite. A snapshot of Solomon and the Shulamite, and it is a biblical view or a redeemed view of romance and intimacy in marriage. A redeemed understanding of romance and intimacy in marriage. In this time, I would want you to be able to recognize a few different points I'm going to cover, okay? So one is an introduction about the, uh, the lies of the world concerning uh, romance and intimacy. Second, we're going to focus in on um, the book of Song of Songs, or the book of Song of Solomon, and how do we interpret or understand that book. Then we'll look at the, what the, some of the main themes in the book, in those is, that's entitled in your sheet, Wisdom from Solomon, Wisdom from the Shulamite, or Wisdom for the Men, Wisdom for the Ladies. And there'll be some overlap there. And then some practical applications. We'll focus on some practical applications. So, um, so introduction, the lies of the world, how to interpret the book, wisdom from Solomon and the Shulamite, and then finally applications that you can refer to and speak about with your, your spouse. So first off, let's consider the way the world views romance and intimacy. The, we live in a very immoral and pornographic time. And we cannot pretend that our society does not have an influence on our marriages. Media is in all different forms and places. You can have the media in your pocket with a smartphone now, or you can have it in TV or the internet. It's possible to have it in almost every place. Consider some of these statistics by way of introduction. 10 years ago, in 2006, it was reported that $13.33 billion of revenue came from pornography in the U.S. on the internet. That revenue exceeds the revenue of, combined revenue of ABC, CBS, and NBC. Consider in the same year, 27.4 billion revenue of pornography in China for the same uh, industry. Another statistic is the average age of the first internet Pornography exposure is 11 years old. 11 years old is the average age that someone's first exposed to this. This is, uh, these six statistics are 10 years old, but listen to these. 12% of all websites, 12% of all websites are pornographic. Consider 25% of all search engine results one out of every four people who searches something in Google, it is of an immoral nature. That is an amazing statistic, isn't it? One out of four people that search something in Google. 34% of average users receive unwanted pornographic exposure. And 42.7% of internet users view pornography. Think about how common that is in our culture. You know when you try and watch TV, right? You try and watch something pure, and the commercials that come in and come into your, your eyes, the uh, novelas in, in Spanish or the, the um, soap operas, that come, the, the ideas of romance that are prevalent in our culture, in our society, are immoral, they're against God, and I can speak from the man's perspective or the woman's perspective, whether it's an immoral view of romance and whether there's something admirable about the, the man who swoops in in an adulterous romance, or whether it, you're thinking about the actual act. 
we are affected. We are not uh, strangers to our culture. We live in it, and it affects us to a greater degree than we think. It affects you to a greater degree than you realize. The way you think about romance and intimacy in your marriage is affected by the fall. It's affected today. But like Pastor Victor was teaching and and preaching, there is hope, there is hope in God and in the gospel. God has a better way. God has a better way for romance and intimacy and marriage, and he has given us a book, a book of wisdom, a book of the gospel applied. The gospel applied to romance, and God is the author of such good things as romance and intimacy. We saw that in our last lesson as well. Since since, since it, it is ordained and God is the author of it, then God is the one who has the plan in redemption for what it should be. And so today I want to preach to you the gospel according to the Song of Solomon. I want to preach to you uh, that there is, uh, in true salvation, God has a plan for how you are to live in light of this salvation, how you're to live in light in your marriage, and how it's to be vastly different than how the culture views these things, than how you used to think about these things. You are to be renewed, your mind is to be renewed today by the wisdom that's in the Song of Solomon. So consider now, first off, the gospel. By way, by way, again, by way of introduction, the gospel that's in the Song of Solomon. Some of these um, big view understanding of the book, okay? Solomon, remember some of the, the major uh, signposts in the Bible. The covenants, the, pro- the promises of God, the Davidic covenant. Remember, we went over um, the covenant of grace in Genesis 1 and how that influence, it should influence our marriages with hope, the salvation that is in Christ. Well, that promise continues through the Bible and continues in the time of Solomon's day with the Davidic covenant. With the Davidic covenant. And Solomon is the promised, is part of that promised heir for the Messiah to come through. Okay? So understanding that the author of the Song of Solomon if you're um, in the big picture, redemptive historical picture of, of salvation, the Bible is coming from the one where the Savior is going to come through His line. He uh, He is a picture of that future hope. And we also, from the New Testament, when we look back on the Song of Solomon, we understand Paul's teaching from Ephesians five that marriage itself is a type of the relationship between Christ and the church. So when you look at this book of Song of Solomon, you, and you understand it in a big picture, you understand it, it is a picture of what a redeemed marriage should be like, a redeemed by God, what it should be like in romance, in relationship, in joy, in intimacy. And you understand it in light of the hope that comes through Jesus Christ in the very um, family line of the one who wrote it and with the New Testament helping you look back and see that marriage itself is to be a picture of the mercy of God, the mercy and the relationship between God and his church. So in that sense, the type of marriage, that, that smaller picture that's pointing to a greater reality, your momentary marriage, your momentary marriage is also to be a type. It's also to be focused and directed, a signpost pointing towards how good God is and how in his work in the church. Okay, so considering the, the lies of the world, let's now consider how to interpret the book of Song of Solomon or the book of Song of Songs. If you look on your sheet, I have their author genre wisdom. Author genre wisdom. One of the difficulties in understanding the book of Song of Songs is looking at the author. The author. Because the author is Solomon. If you, if you have your Bibles open to the Song of Songs or the Song of Solomon, you can, and you read verse one, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. 
That's why many will call it the Song of Songs, and perhaps a more appropriate title than Song of Solomon, because it's the book that itself gives that title. And the title is, is, has a significance of saying, this is, the, this is the song of all songs. Kind of like when you say, this is the king of kings, Jesus Christ, he's the king of all the kings. Well, Solomon is saying, here's a song to sing, and this is the song of all songs. Love. Love, romance, intimacy. Here it is, is um, he's saying that this is the, the song of songs. And, it, and my point here now is, in verse one, it's saying it's, it's from Solomon. The difficulty in reading this is we think about Solomon's life. Right, how many wives does Solomon have? How many concubines does he, ha- does he have? Solomon, when we think of Solomon, we think he is hardly the example to follow in regards to marriage. And what I would say is, uh, think of Ecclesiastes and think about the wisdom that Solomon gives near the end of his life about all of his, his failures and all of his sins and he thinks about the gospel applied to the purpose of life. And he thinks back on how do we look back now on money and um, how do we look back on the purpose of life and he gives us wisdom at that point. It's very similar with the Song of Songs. He looks back, not as one as, as the savior, but as a sinner who is saved. He looks back on not one who is the perfect, perfect example, but he points to a, uh, a perfect example in that, that Christ can do in our marriages. In other words, do you come here um, just to listen to uh, the, you don't come here, to, you come here to hear the, the Bible. You come here to hear from God. You don't come here because of the perfection of pastor, the pastors here. You come here looking for hope from God. And it's the same when we look in the book of Song of Solomon. We don't look to Solomon as our great hope. We look to the salvation that he speaks of, the application of the salvation that he speaks of, and what that should be. And so I want you to see, even in the author, even in the, who the author is, God picked out someone who needed a savior to be a, um, someone to be able to, um, near the end of his life, look back and say, here's wisdom, here's what it, what it should have been. Here's what it should have been. Here's what the marriage and um, intimacy and romance should be. So understanding the author we understand the, the, how it speaks about the gospel to us. In understanding the genre of literature, there's been um, much difference in the church ages when you, when you think about uh, the, how to interpret and understand the book of Song of Songs. And I won't spend too, too much time on, on this, but um, I'm going, I take the understanding that the book of Song of Songs has a literal explanation of a, how marriage should be applied and not an allegorical interpretation of the book. And I believe that there is big picture types of, uh, like marriage is a type of relationship between Christ and the church. But in other words, I don't interpret the book as um, when we read in Song of Solomon's 1, 2, um, if you read there, to give you an example, it says, it begins with the Shulamite saying uh, to Solomon, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. The way that I would interpret that is an actual um, poetry, poetry of romance with one spouse to the other, I do not understand that to be somehow a picture of uh, um, Jesus, a relationship with Jesus Christ. Or picturing a, uh, that each particular point in the book is, is an allegory, like, like Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress. When Pilgrim, in Pilgrim's Progress, when you have a story, then it pictures some other reality. Uh, so I take a more literal understanding and interpretation of that. So in understanding that the genre of literature is poetry, and the reason, some of the reasons very quickly why I would believe that is that there, uh, you have to make a literary argument to say that it's allegory, and I don't believe that, that the text itself gives us that argument. I, I believe that there are many other forms of ancient poetry that reflect this romance that we can, we can observe and know in history 
There are other ancient customs, such as a wasif in, uh, in Hebrew, where there, um, there's a wedding poems that the bride and the husband say to each other that is very similar to what's happening in this book. When you look at the genre, it, it, is, it is poetry. It is poetry. And so, um, there, uh, and there's also, if you take an allegorical interpretation, one of the difficulties of it is nobody agrees on many, on, um, and it's, there's an ad hoc or a, um, there is a something of a, there's no rules to define how you interpret the pictures. For example, it's um, one of the examples of that is when Solomon refers to the, the two breasts of, his, of the Shulamite in the Song of Solomon. Um, throughout history, people have um, said that th that represents uh, the church and the people, or the church and how the church feeds off the breasts of the, the, um, the people feed off the breasts of the church, or others have interpreted that picture as the New Testament, Old Testament, or others have interpreted those, that picture as love of God and love of neighbor. Others have interpreted that as blood and water. Others have interpreted that as inner man, outer man. You see, the point is, if you have an allegorical interpretation of that, you can't define what does that mean? What does the, what does the, the picture of that mean? Well, I believe that it means what it literally says, that it's a, um, it's a love poem. It's a love poem. And that it's actually talking about their actual body. Okay, if that makes sense, then I'm just trying to lay some groundwork to understand why I'm explaining the, the book the way I am. Um, so now, consider then what, if, it's, if we don't believe that it's allegory, then what is it? We believe that it's wisdom. Believe that it's wisdom, and this is the consensus of a um, of majority of uh, commentary, commentators nowadays that if it's wisdom, wisdom of the gospel applied. Wisdom of the gospel applied. And that when uh, wisdom is given, like, do you remember in, in 1 Kings when, when God came to Solomon? And he said, I'll give you whatever, whatever you would ask. And what does Solomon ask for? Wisdom. So what does Solomon write? in Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs. He writes that wisdom that the Lord gave him. And that wisdom, each of those books, is the gospel applied. What does the gospel look like in the life of a believer? The gospel looks like wisdom, not foolishness. We're not to view it some, um, the wisdom that's offered in these books, we're not to view it as um, as, as simply a moralism, that here is a, kind, of like, kind of like a Muslim would view a, a, a proverb and say, here's, here's something that if I do it, I'm a better person. No, we don't understand the, the, the wisdom there. We understand the wisdom that's offered in those books as here's what the gospel looks like. When God saves a sinner, they look like a wise person. They don't look like a fool anymore, Okay? So now the, the wisdom here, think about, uh, I'm laying all this foundation so that you can, when I give some wisdom later from the actual book that you'll understand and understand how to apply it. The wisdom here, wisdom doesn't work simply by do this, okay? Wisdom is not a command. Now understand the difference. Wisdom is something that God puts forward as a beautiful thing outside of you, and you have to have the eyes to see the beauty that's there. You have to be able to say, I see that beautiful plan. I see it, and I wish and I want that to be in my life. I see that, that, that beautiful, God's beautiful plan, and I desire that. I want that. I des desire to apply that. Wisdom, you see how wisdom is, is not gonna, God is not gonna just push it in your face and say, you must do this. Wisdom, he sets up and says, you're, and to win your heart, to win your desires, to say, look, this is the better way. This is the better way. So, 
um, this book doesn't stress covenant, promise, redemption, forgiveness. Instead, it shows it applied to life. Um, when the book, because it's wisdom, when the book uses much imagery, when the book talks about jewels, flowers, scents, oils, pleasures, these are general emblems of beauty and desire. The imagery and the compliments are culturally sensitive. So some of the brothers were joking with me. They know um, some of the aspects of the book and they, they would talk about, um, they point, can point out how Solomon, when he talks about how his wife found her nose is like a tower. And a, a particular tower, I can't remember the, the name right now. Uh, we wouldn't use that, uh, <laughs> that directly, right? To talk about your, how your wife's nose is a, is a beautiful tower. <laughs> because it's not culturally sensitive. <laughs> but we would take the wisdom that's there we would take the wisdom that is there and say, how can I say the same thing, but in a way that she would like? In a, in a metaphor, in, a, in an imagery that she, that she would see and grasp. For, for example, I was talking about this with my wife, and if, if we were to take, say, a, um, a figure of speech today, and we say, um, if I tell my wife she looks hot today, and then I would take that to ancient Israel and write that down in a book, then people in ancient Israel would be like, it's hot enough here in Israel as it is. What are you talking about? <laughs> right? They would not understand the metaphor. So in our understanding, there, um, you, when you would desire to apply this book with your spouse, you understand that you're going to need to take the wisdom that's there, and most of the time you won't be able to directly use it out of the book, but you'll be able to get the idea, the paradigm, on how to apply that in your marriage. Okay? So one other point of laying the foundation before we get into the book is consider how recently, especially in the last 10 years, there has been what one Bible teacher called the rape of the Song of Solomon. And what he means by that is that particularly in the past 10 years, even some in the reform movement have used the book of Song of Solomon as a... Uh, as a dirty way of attracting people into the church. They use the book of Psalm, Song of Solomon where the Song of Solomon when itself is very, speaks in veiled ways. They use it and, and to make it a coarse thing or an immoral thing. And you may have seen or heard sermons like that. That's why I'm referencing it now where they talk about immorality in a very crude, crass way. Or they talk about um, the Song of Solomon, I'm sorry, Song of Solomon in a very crude and crass way. One commentator speaks of people who do this. It's um, when people do this, where they see um, an imagery and they make it a crude, they make it um, in their own mind, they make the imagery part of the sex act or they make the imagery part of the anatomy of a, a man or woman. That is something they are seeing into Song of Solomon. That's something where, and the commentator, um, I believe it's Hess, he was saying that that speaks more about the person who's doing that than the Song of Solomon. And you understand what I'm saying? Is that, that speaks more about the corruption in their own heart to twist the word of God into something crass that uh, it speaks more about them than it does the book. The book itself speaks in a discreet, veiled way. It speaks plainly, where it does talk undoubtedly about intimacy. It does um, speak about the, the husband and wife enjoying each other's bodies. But it doesn't do it in a crass way. It does it in a way that you could read it, the book of, Song of, of Songs, to the church as a whole, and kids wouldn't know what's going on, but parents would. You see? But pe some people today preach it in such a way you could not have, uh, you should not have adults listening to the way they speak, let alone, let alone kids. Okay, so um, I just want to speak against that uh, and, and part of the foundation, in knowing that you will see that in our sex craze culture. You'll see that, you'll see more, it's growing and it's, it's very disgusting and it's not that it's a, an abuse of the book of Song of Solomon. That's not, when you see the book of Song of Solomon, what I don't want you to think is simply S-E-X. I do not want you to think that. 
don't just look at that and think um, it is not the book is not a sex, ma sex manual. It is not a graphic description of sex. No body part or no sex act is described in the book. Okay, I want you to see it as a as the gospel applied to uh, the gospel applied to romance and intimacy where it is hinted at, it is, um, it is shown for what it be the beauty that it is. Uh, rightly, rightly understood, uh, consider this quote from Grasping God's Word. The Song of, Song, Song of Songs celebrates the wild, irrational, mushy, and corny aspects of true love. This book suggests to us that in the marketplace, husbands and wives may... Uh, may need to be the quiet, discerning, hardworking people of Proverbs. But that once the lights go out in the privacy of their home, they need to be the crazy, madly in love, slightly irrational couple in the Song of Songs. Do you understand that? That's a beautiful picture. That's a beautiful picture. That it's something, the Song of Songs, is wisdom, the gospel applied, that's something that nobody sees but your spouse. Something nobody, the wisdom that you see, will see today is something that only your spouse knows of. And with a simple word, discreetly said, you could say that, um, and, or a look, or a wink, or a glance, you can communicate that with your spouse in public where they know and nobody else knows how, what uh, you have enjoyed together, the gospel applied in privacy. And I want you to, to be able to Realize that this is a description of the marriage bed is undefiled, but fornic fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. The gospel applied. Okay, so after setting all that foundation, after setting all that foundation, let's look in the book. Let's hear some wisdom from Solomon. Let's hear some wisdom from the Shulamite. And consider some of the application in our marriages. So I'm going to run through some themes now through the book of Song of Solomon. Let's consider and in, in read chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, the introduction. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is, a, is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Draw me away. Remember in the book of Song of Songs that you can understand most of the time by, no, by the Hebrew words in the description of the number, gender, person, the person, you can understand who's speaking, okay? And many of your Bibles have that over the top, they'll have the Shulamite or they have the, um, the beloved. The way that I, uh, my wife and I studied this book in 2009 when we got married in the, uh, the time just before and after our, our marriage. And so I pulled out my old Bible that I have those notes in to be able to use today and I highlighted with red when the Shulamite is speaking and green when the guy is speaking. Okay, so I'm saying, as you listen to this, understand and look at the headings in your book to be able to understand who's speaking. So here, here we have the Shulamite speaking. What are some of the wisdom that you see? When you see this love poem, this love poetry, and this collection of poetry assembled together, what's some of the wisdom that you see here and can apply in this first section? Well, you can see a gratefulness to God a gratefulness to God uh, that the, um, the Shulamite expresses wisdom as she compliments and expresses a desire for her husband. What does she consider uh, the wisdom of this? If you are not grateful to God, if the gospel isn't applied, in other words, if, you th if you're thinking, I deserve better, I deserve better than what I'm getting. That you won't be able to express this. You see how this is a necessary application of the gospel. The gospel makes it so you realize you don't deserve anything but wrath from God, 
So then the good news that he brings, the good gifts that he brings are better than you deserve. That grateful heart begins to look then at your spouse with redeemed eyes and realizing you have been given something that's better than you deserve. And so then you begin to see in your spouse, in romance, in intimacy, something that you better than you deserve. And here, she expresses a love and um, wanting him to, t- to draw her away. Consider the wisdom of how she's taking an initiative here. She's taking initiative in the romance. So it's, it's all right. Do you see how the Shulamite does that? It's all right for ladies to do that in times. You notice, guys, the wisdom could be for you. Look at how he smells nice. <laughs> you see how there, there's something that's very practical? She likes the, the cologne. She likes the way he washes up. She likes that he doesn't smell uh, like the gym room. Consider how in verse three also, not only she likes the way she, he smells, but he likes his, she likes his good name. Your name is an ointment poured forth. Do you see that? In verse three, both the way he smells and his good name. It's his good character and he, he prepares himself for her. You see there's a connection, guys, between the two. You can't just throw on cologne and, and immediately think that uh, you're gonna be ready for romance. Guys think more like a microwave. Ladies think more like a crock pot in regards to romance. You remember that analogy? So you need to realize, guys, that what she, the wisdom here of what she loves is not only that he prepares himself in a good way, but he prepares his good name. There's a relationship there where she admires his, what he's doing. For Remember how in Hebrew your, your name represents all that you are. It represents your character. So you can't live ungodly and look good and think that your wife is going to desire to have romance with you. You need to be a godly man. A combination of those pr- very practical things and those big picture things the gospel applied. The more you live godly, the more a godly wife desires you. You can't be so godly that you don't wash up. <laughs> but you have the combination of the two. Do you see? And what godly woman can resist a clean, godly man who has a good name? That's wisdom. That's wisdom. Think about when you, when you see some of the things, think about the practicality of God's plan and see the beauty of it. Here is it. Uh, of, I uh, introduced this, this teaching by talking about the horrors of the world and the, the uh, horrors of immorality to contrast the beauty of this here. This book has a beauty that you should look at, you should see the wisdom of it, and desire it and say, I want that to be applied in my marriage. So moving on, consider some other passages. Uh, in Read with me verses five and six where the Shulamite is speaking, and she's saying, I'm dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem. Like the tents of Keter, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I'm dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Here she's concerned about because the, the degree of the tan that she has while she's been working. Consider the wisdom of of how you prepare yourself and how you look for your wife or for your husband. There's something where she's conscious of that. She's wanting to please him with her appearance. Uh, the clothes that you dress, the way that you do your hair, the way that, how much weight you have, consider those things in view of what your spouse would want. There's a practical uh, application there that your body is not your own. So you don't just eat what you want, just do whatever you want. You have in your mind that your body is owned by your spouse. Here, she has some of that concern. Uh, now, what is, the, what is the, in verse eight, how does the beloved, when he first speaks, uh, is, he, uh, is he speaking about what she's conscious of? No, 
No, he is grateful. He expresses that gospel gratefulness with her, for her beauty. Read with me in verse eight. If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. I have compared you, my love, to my filly among Pharaoh's chariots. Your cheeks are lovely with ornaments, your neck with chains of gold. Consider again the gospel gratefulness. Men, how are you ready to compliment your wife continually? Are you ready to observe and meditate upon her beauty? How much effort and time do you express meditating on the beauty of your wife? Look at verse 15. Behold, you are fair, my love. You are fair. You have dove's eyes. Look at chapter two, verse two. Like a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. Do you see his gospel gratefulness? He doesn't sit there thinking, I wish I had a wife that yada, 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 yada. I wish she looked this way. I wish she had this aspect to her. No, he thinks, meditates, expresses to her repeatedly. So do you compliment and work at complimenting the beauty, the worth of your wife? Do you use metaphors? You see, the use of a metaphor makes it so that um, you, can't ju- you don't just uh, think it up on the spot. It's a, like a love note that you have to prepare beforehand, so it's actually a compliment. You can't just pick it out and say like, um, oh, you look like one of the horses, Pharaoh's horses. <laughs> you see how it takes, Solomon takes time to express what is it that expresses beauty in the culture? What is it that, um, that, that I can compare my wife with that would be able to communicate her with thoughtfulness and that she would appreciate Do you take the time to pursue your wife in these ways? Do you delight in her? And this is expressing a gospel gratefulness, a gospel gratefulness. Consider how uh, the, uh, the wisdom of planning trips and uh, away together. Look at how um, in chapter one, verses 16 to 17, the Shulamite, she says to him, behold, you are handsome, my beloved. Yes, pleasant. Also, our bed is green. The beams of our houses are cedar and our rafters of fir. I am the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valleys. She's expressing how they have taken a romantic trip and that they're, uh, they're outside. Consider also different places of the, this same, uh, this same picture here in chapter two, where they go to beautiful places, and here the beloved speaks, or Solomon speaks in in chapter two, verse ten. My beloved spoke and said to me, "Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away, for lo, the winter is past, the rain is over and gone." The flowers appear on the earth. The time of singing has come. The voice of the turtle dove is heard in our land. The fig tree puts forth her green figs and the vines with the tender grapes give a good smell. Rise up, my love, my fair one, and come away. There is wisdom in uh, making the time for romance. If romance doesn't happen um, like a microwave, it takes time together. Have you become so busy? Have you become so busy with so many other things that you don't have time to romance your spouse? That's not wisdom. That's foolishness. Take the time to aside, take the time to travel with your spouse, take the time to travel and spend time alone. It doesn't have to be expensive if you don't have money for it. Uh, You can go to beautiful places that are free. That are free. You can go to them and you can uh, enjoy the romance and time with your spouse. If your life has become too busy, too busy with ministry, too busy with good things, too busy with work, too busy with kids, you need to see the wisdom here and take the time. 
take the time. You are in a momentary marriage, beloved. Your marriage won't last for all eternity. You have a marriage perhaps for 50 years, maybe 60 if you're, if you're blessed. Your marriage will not go into eternity. Enjoy the marriage that you have now and let it be a picture of how good and loving God is to his church. So take the time here. Look in, in chapter four. Look at the wisdom of, I'll begin to read in verse one, chapter four. Behold, you are fair, my love. Here is Solomon, the beloved, speaking. Behold, you are fair, my love. Behold, you are... Uh, you are fair, you have dove's eyes behind your veil. Your hair is like a flock of goats going down from Mount Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of shorn sheep which have come up from the washing, every one of it which bears twins and none of them is barren among them. Your lips are like a strand of scarlet. Your mouth is lovely. Your temples behind your veil are like a piece of pomegranate. Your neck is like the Tower of David built for an armory on which hang a thousand bucklers, all shields of mighty men. Your two breasts are like a two fawns, twins of a gazelle, which feed among the, the lilies. You drop down to verse nine. You are, have ravished my heart, my sister, my spouse. You've ravished my heart with one look of your eyes, with one link of your necklace. Look at the end of verse 10. And the scent of your perfumes and all, spouse, and all spices. Verse 11. Your lips, O oh my spouse, drip as the honeycomb. Honey and milk are under your tongue. And the fragrance of your garments is like the fragrance of Lebanon. Consider how he meditates on the beauties of his wife. He takes each part and he writes poetry. He writes expressing the love and desire. You see how that, that takes time. That takes time to meditate on. It takes time and it's worth it. Enjoy the blessing that God has given you. Consider wisdom of, um, so some of the wisdom we've talked about is gospel gratefulness that complements your spouse. Wisdom that we've seen is taking the, the man or the woman taking the initiative. Wisdom that we've seen is taking, planning trips away, going away together, spontaneously or planned. Wisdom that we've seen is that you are to work at complementing with metaphors the beauty of your spouse. You need to keep your thoughts, wisdom is keep your thoughts and eyes for her. Look at chapter six, verses three and nine. Chapter six, verse three. Wisdom applied is your thoughts and your delights are to be just for your spouse and no one else. Chapter three, I am my beloved's and my beloved is mine. He feeds his flock among the lilies. Look at verse nine. Now the beloved speaks. My dove, my perfect one, is the only one. The only one of her mother. The favorite of the one who bore her. The daughter saw her and called her blessed. The queens and the concubines and they praised her. Consider how the, the exclusivity of the, the delight in the relationship you need to daydream and lust over your spouse. Absence should make your heart grow fonder. Absence should make your heart grow fonder. Look at chapter three, verses one to five. Here we have the bride, the Shulamite, speaking. In verse one, by night on, bed I, on my bed I sought the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. I will rise now and go about the city in the streets of the squares. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but I did not find him. The watchmen who go about the city found me. I said, have you seen the one I love? Scarcely have I passed by when I found the one I love. I held him and would not let him go until I had brought him into the house of my mother and into the chamber of her who conceived me. I charge you, O daughters of Jerusalem, by the gazelles or by the does of the field, do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. Here we see the wisdom, another aspect of wisdom. Write these down, remember these, apply these in your marriage. The wisdom that absence from your spouse should make your heart grow fonder. So you see, in her absence, 
She doesn't say, well, now I can get to work to something that I, uh, um, I wanted to do, but now that he's gone. Instead, she uses time away from him in, in concern and looking for him and in daydreaming and in satisfaction when they are reunited. And then she takes that initiative not only to um, desire the relationship, but to desire the intimacy back with him. And she brings him and they go together back into that intimacy. Except, wisdom would be accepting the romantic advances of your spouse. Look at chapter 4, verse 16. The, the, spa, the bride says, Awaken, O north wind, and come, O south. Blow upon my garden that its spices might flow out. Let my beloved come to his garden and eat its pleasant fruits. She wants him to come and enjoy her. He wants to. You need to accept the romantic advances of your spouse. <coughs> Excuse me. Now remember, what's the theme that I've been, um, uh, I've been coming back to? The gospel applied means that you will have gratefulness for this. It means you'll have mercy in this. When you think about the past history with your spouse in regards to romance and intimacy, we ha- many of us have experiences that are not what they should be. Many of us have I- immoral experiences from our past lives. Many of us can dwell on those wrong experiences, but when the gospel is applied, it means that you have humility, it means that you have gratefulness, it means that you work forward in, with, with mercy as God has mercy. So now, to begin to, to close, when we look over some of this wisdom from Solomon, from the Shulamite, to, to summarize, for you to write down, you guys, wisdom, personal hygiene, verse, chapter one, verse three. A good name, chapter one, verse three. Plan trips, chapter two, verses 10 to 13. Keep listening, guys. Compliment her continually, chapter one, verses eight to 10, verse 15, chapter two, verse two. Guys, express her beauty, her worth, Chapter 4, verses 1 to 15. Delight in her. Pursue her. Guys, chapter 6, verses 3 and 9, teach you to keep your eyes and your thoughts just for her. Chapter 7, verses 1 to 9, show about how you should daydream, delight in, enjoy, lust over your spouse. Ladies, listen. Wisdom from the Shulamite. Wisdom from the Shulamite. Chapter 1, verses 2 to 3, Compliment him. Chapter 1, verse 4, take the initiative. Chapter 1, verse 6, take care of yourself physically for him. Chapter 1, verse 16 to 17, plan trips to beautiful places together. Ladies, listen. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 5, absence should make your heart grow fonder. Often in, in a beautiful marriage, the one who's staying home is the one who has the opportunity to plan more. Why that sometimes when the, when the spouse goes, uh, when the wife goes shopping, then the guy can stay home and plan out something uh, in that absence for when she comes home or vice versa. Ladies, listen, the wisdom. Chapter four, verse 16, accept his romantic advances, desire them. Chapter five, verses 10 to 16, daydream, lust of your spouse. And in chapter 8, we will read this last verse from Song of Solomon. Chapter 8, verses 6 to 7. Consider the importance that romance and love are not just, are, um, we're not just talking about sex here. We're talking about a, uh, the whole person. In verses 6 and 7, set me as a seal, uh, this is of chapter 8, set me as a seal upon your heart, as a seal upon your arm, for love is as strong as death, jealousy as cruel as the grave. Its flames are flames of fire, a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Do you see 
Do you, can you warm your relationship by the flames of the, of the passion of Solomon and the Shulamite? Warm your cold relationship by the flames and the heat that you can read by reading these love poems. And know that God has given these love poems as a wisdom to you for you to be applying in your marriage. That's wisdom. The fool, the fool lets life go by. So now, um, remember our theme. The gospel applied in Song of Solomon. There once was a, a husband who had a who had a great love for his wife. And she, uh, uh, she went and she committed adultery on him. And he was crying out to God. Crying out to God, God, why would you uh, allow this to happen? And she continued to commit adultery on him, so much so that she began to work as a prostitute. She began to work as a prostitute, and he had to go, and he had to go and purchase her in order to bring her home. You remember that story from Hosea? Well, what is that story a greater picture of? You were the one committing adultery on God. You were committing adultery on God in idolatry. And God himself went to the slave market and bought you back a whore and he bought you back, he bought you by his own blood. He bought you by his own blood, purchased you to save you and bring you to a real pure relationship to him where you love him more than anything else. This is the gospel. Since God has had this relationship for his people, he pleads this way with Israel of old and he pleads this way in the redemption for how he purchased his bride, the church by his own blood. Should you not apply the gospel to your spouse? Should you not have grace for your spouse in this way? Do you see how the gospel is the heart? Now let's close with practical applications. Practical applications. Um, Humble yourself to ask your spouse what they would like and dislike. You gotta shut your mouth and open your ears and you gotta not do what you think will be best. You need to do um, what they would want, what would be pleasing to them. Take the time to do that privately with your spouse and uh, if you've done that before, do it again. Because you'll need the reminders. You slump back into your old rut. You slump back into your old rut and you think it's okay. No, go back again, go back again and perhaps you will learn something new. You will learn something new that your spouse will tell you that you weren't thinking about, that you'd forgotten, but they would desire. Take the time and humble yourself to ask your spouse what they would like or dislike in romance or in intimacy. The, the love package. Take time off. Say no to th some things so you can make your, your spouse a priority in this way. Take time off for this. Take the time to assess with your spouse and grade your marriage in this regard. Consider these grades that I could offer as an um, example. Um, your grade w could be A to B. A to B, that would be like often your marriage is as hot as the Florida sand on a summer afternoon. Often. As hot as the Florida sand on a summer afternoon. Consider the grade C to D. You regularly neglect to put effort into romancing your spouse or effort into intimacy. Or consider the grade of F. Sins of some kind have drained desire from you. Bitterness, anger, viewing immoral 
uh, material, thoughts of another, if it thoughts, uh, letting thoughts of adultery come in your mind, idolatry. Idolatry does this. If you love something more than God, it will drain your good desires out of you. In other words, if you're a workaholic and you, you, and you put too much effort, effort into work, then you neglect your spouse. It's because you, you have lost love for God and instead you have love for whatever work you're doing instead of God and that will drain your good desires. You'll say, I'm, not too, I'm too busy. I got too many things to do. And you see that's a result of not applying the gospel, of not having loving God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Consider how uh, intimacy is instituted by God. Romance instituted by God from the garden and now to be applied in your redeemed marriage. Therefore, it can be pure, it can be holy, it can be enjoyed. Keep sex in perspective. Love is the issue. The relationship as a whole is the issue. Sex is important, but it is not the whole. It is a part of a greater picture romance, intimacy should not be self-focused but it should not be self-serving. Please hear me on this point. It, you need to consider the good of, your, of the spouse. You do not see the, the Solomon or the Shulamite uh, considering only self-interest. They delight in pleasing their spouse. Romance and intimacy are a culmination of the relationship. They're a culmination of the relationship. Understand sexual excitement is most certainly different in your spouse. You need to humble yourself to understand again and again, understand what will be pleasing to them. And understand that this, this joy, this blessing is to be enjoyed regularly, joyfully, and enthusiastically. That is wisdom from God's word. Beloved, consider in closing, God has given a whole book to teach you how not just to um, the, the fact that the marriage bed is undefiled, but he's given you a whole book on how to romance your spouse. Would you neglect that wisdom? Would you neglect that wisdom of the gospel applied? Don't neglect it. Don't be a fool. See the beauty. See the beauty that God displays in this, these love poems. See the beauty and understand that the gospel applied there, the gospel applied in this way, is a reflection of Christ's love for his church. It's a reflection of how God saves you in the gospel. And in that way, you can be the type, you can be the picture of Christ and his church. Here's the picture that God wants you to be with your spouse. Please value this wisdom. Value this wisdom and apply it. Let's pray. Dear Lord God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the good news of the gospel. Thank you for redeeming us. Uh, though we were, we were cheating on you. We were idolaters, Lord. Thank you for buying us out of the slave market of sin. And dear God, we pray, please help us to apply the gospel by romancing and pursuing our, our spouses with love, not being self-focused, but considering the good of others. We need you, Lord, to apply wisdom. We need you to see wisdom. We need you to have this gospel grace, Lord. Help us to love you above all else, Lord God, and help us to apply that love for you with great love for our spouses. Amen.